from the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Writer's Talk. I'm Doug Dangler. James L. Swanson is the Edgar Award winning author of the New York Times bestseller, Manhunt, The Twelve Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer. Swanson has degrees in history from the University of Chicago where he stundered, studied under John Hope Franklin and law from the University of California, Los Angeles. He has written for the Wall Street Journal, Smithsonian, and the Los Angeles Times. He's in town with the always excellent Thurber House series to discuss his latest book, Bloody Crimes, The Chase for Jefferson Davis and the Death Pageant for Lincoln's Corpse. Welcome, James L. Swanson. Thanks for having me. Well, let's start with your latest, The Chase for Jefferson Davis and the Death Pageant for Lincoln's Corpse. You spent this morning touring the Columbus State House, uh, which was one of the stops on the tour, right? Tell me about, after having written this whole book, your feelings of uh, going to one of the stops on the pageant. What did you... Well, it was great to see it because I hadn't been to this spot on the tour yet for the Lincoln funeral train, which of course stopped in Baltimore, New York, Albany, Cleveland, mm -hmm. Columbus, Indianapolis, Chicago, Springfield, and other cities along the way. I always like to go to the places where history happened. I often find my inspiration there. And I've seen a number of photographs of the State House and prints, and I've read all the descriptions of what happened here. So it was a great pleasure to go inside the building and stand on the very spot where Abraham Lincoln's coffin once rested. The floor is the same, the tile is the same, the decorations, the artwork. And then I climbed to the cupola and looked oh, out. Good. And you I got, got that tour, yes. right. And, uh, the, That's that, not a public tour. But the cupola is so distinctive in photographs when the building is draped in mourning for Lincoln. Mm -hmm. The columns once had black and white crepe draped up and down the length of the columns. So it, it felt very vivid to come and see the place after reading about it so much and looking at it in historic photographs. And they've re converted a lot of the basement where I think the horses were all kept and into that. That's now being used for studio space and things like that. So it's a different experience. I imagine walking through <laughs> the coal shuttles, what used to be down there, and the horses and all that stuff. But it's still uh, built in the same way. Uh, yes, it had a very historic feel. And I, I went, looked at the artifacts there and, and looked at the museum displays. It was a great tour. And in the top in the tour, they've got names of people who've been up there, dignitaries. Yes, yes, so I, I signed my name up okay, there. Okay, all right. They didn't let me sign my name when I was up there, but uh, <laughs> other people get to. But they've got a lot of different famous uh, people up there that have gone through and, um, you know, always touring through. So <clears throat> Lincoln lay in state in Ohio, but he visited a, a few other times. Where else did you go in, in the state house? I'm curious, did you want to go to the other places that he was? I did. I visited the House of Representatives, I visited the Senate, and then I visited the column near which Lincoln stood when he spoke here, when it was still outdoors, before the additional building was added to the complex. Oh, okay. There was an addition. I walked up the staircase Lincoln walked up. I looked at the table that Lincoln once sat at, so it was a great Lincoln tour. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And I know they're very, uh, they do some things each year to commemorate different aspects of uh, Lincoln's life and passing through. And you've written or collaborated on a number of Lincoln-related projects. Tell me how you became interested in him. Is it just because your well, birthday? Well, it, it was shared? fate or destiny. I was born on Lincoln's birthday mm -hmm. in Illinois, Lincoln country, okay. and I visited some of the Lincoln sites as a boy, New Salem, the pioneer village where Lincoln lived as a young man. Also Spring, Springfield, of course, the state, state capital where Lincoln served as a legislator for a number of years. And also visited the Chicago Historical Society often because that's a museum that owns the bed in which Lincoln died. It's not in Washington. It was oh, really? bought in the 1920s for a fantastic sum by a local candy millionaire. And the museum <laughs> recreated the entire Lincoln death bedroom. Unfortunately, now it's been completely dismantled. Once upon a time, you could go there as a kid and push a button in a wall, and a somber voice would begin speaking and narrate the story. But I guess that it was considered old-fashioned, and so the whole display has been So who got destroyed. parts of the display? Did they well, trace it, that? It's still all at the Chicago Historical Society, but they've just dismantled the Lincoln death room. They still have the bed, but uh, the room is gone. Well, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating about this, reading about this, is because there's this sense of, of morbidity, and I think your title gets at that, the, the um, pa death pageant for Lincoln's corpse, you know, and, and there's this sense of, of uh, this fascination with the death that seems to have been part and parcel of the time that you're writing yes. about because the Civil War had so many people uh, that had died and, uh, and often the medical care was pretty awful at the time. Tell me about your sense of writing about that time. What th they seem to have treated death very differently. Yes. Well, I certainly use that title in, in really specific reason. Mm -hmm. I, just, I didn't want to say funeral 
because that implies one static event and then it's over. This was a nationwide pageant and certainly it had its morbid side. Over one million people viewed the corpse of Lincoln over a 20-day period. He lay unburied for 20 days and that funeral train journey took 13 days. Of those million people, 100,000 children viewed the corpse. An undertaker and an embalmer had to ride aboard that train in a desperate effort to keep the body presentable along the way. You can read contemporary, contemporary descriptions which mention heaps of flowers that surrounded the coffin in each city. Well, that just wasn't for reasons to appeal to the eye and for beauty. The overwhelming scent of the flowers was used to mask any odors that might arise from Lincoln decomposing along the way, which was happening. It was a very emotional and sorrowful journey, but it did have its very morbid side. But that was part of the Victorian method of death and mourning. Mm -hmm. So, what uh, when you went back to research this book, how did you do it? I mean, there's a like you've written extensively on Lincoln. What else is left to write about? How did you find a new avenue into it? Well, there are 15,000 books about Abraham Lincoln, and almost everything is covered. In, in my first book, Manhunt, The Twelve-Day Chase for Lincoln's Killer, no one had written a day-by-day, hour-by-hour, and sometimes minute-by-minute account of the Lincoln assassination. And to my great surprise, that book was there to be written. That's a story I always wanted to read. Mm -hmm. From childhood, I was very interested in Lincoln's life and death, including the assassination. I got very interested in that when my grandmother, who worked for the old Chicago tabloid newspapers, gave me, as a gift when I was 10 years old, a framed engraving of John Wilkes Booth's Derringer pistol. And framed with that was part of a clipping from the Chicago Tribune from the morning Lincoln died, April 15, 1865. And I remember reading that clipping, it must have been a hundred times. Booth, the famous actor, shoots the president. He leaps to the stage at Ford's Theater. He cries out, he vanishes into the wings, and, and at that point, someone had cut the clipping off in mid-sentence. And I remember saying to myself, I want to know the rest of the story. I want to know what happened. So it's really been a lifelong quest. And the way I do these books is through the original sources, not photocopies or microfilm of newspaper, the actual Civil War newspaper. I want to feel that rag paper in my hand. I want to see the old ads. I look at diaries, photographs, artworks, relics. And whenever I can, I look at the original thing. Uh, not a black and white copy of a Courier and Ives print of Richmond burning, but the actual print alive with flames and red and orange and huge format. And when I look at Civil War photographs, I don't look really like to look at modern copies. I like to hold the original photograph in my hand. How often do you get to do that? How often do you get to hold the artifact or you just have to look at it, say, behind glass? Well, I've been very lucky. I've, I've gotten to look at a lot of these original artifacts, whether it's a lock of Lincoln's hair, a piece of the actress Laura Keene's theatrical costume that was stained with Lincoln's blood when she held him in her lap after he was shot. I've looked at original relics from the funeral train, flagpoles, fringe, uh, pieces of fabric. Uh, I've gotten to do that at museums and in private collections, so I feel very lucky to have had access to these original things. What, what's, when you say museums and private collections, which seems to you to be the more surprising uh, of the two? Uh, do, are there things in private collections that you're, you were really taken aback by, like the bloodstained cloth? Um, I don't know where that resides, but that seems to me to be something like, it would really be hard to trace where that came from. You know, it's been long enough that there's all kinds of, it's like getting a piece of the cross. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, <laughs> unlike the piece of the cross, most of these things are really real because they come with the provenance and documents. For example, the fragment of Laura Keene's dress is accompanied by a letter from her son-in-law written at the turn of the century. And that fragment of the dress matches the other four known fragments, all the same color, all the same fabric, so we can authenticate it. In the case of a Lincoln lock of hair, it's just not a piece of hair. It comes in the original envelope addressed by Secretary of War Stanton, who cut the lock of hair from Lincoln's head the morning he died, gave it to the wife of the Secretary of the Navy, and she in turn framed that lock of hair with flowers that adorned Lincoln's coffin at the White House funeral. So we have their letters and their handwriting in addition to the original relics, and that, that authenticates them. And you write in the book uh, that there were a couple different locks of hair taken, and I remember as I was reading this thinking, I hadn't read that before, and thinking that's so strange to consider. I mean, it's like they almost gave him a haircut. Uh, yes. something. That's not because you have one lock of hair, I don't know how much consists of a lock, but it seems like there were four or five of them. At they? least. The doctors took some, the autopsy surgeons took some. Uh, you do wonder how Lincoln was buried with any hair at all, 
because these locks were quite generous, hundreds of strands of hair in an individual lock. Hmm. Uh, how many of those exist still? Uh, Probably up to 10. Oh my, really? Mm -hmm. Wow. Of the, uh, Mary Lincoln wanted one, several of the physicians who treated the living Lincoln wanted one, mm -hmm. the autopsy doctors wanted them, and of course the Secretary of War clipped the very first one for the wife of the Secretary of the Navy. Okay. So obviously that's a part of the book that a lot of people will flip through and, and turn to because it's uh, the most, uh, one of the most emotional parts of the book. What was the most interesting or your favorite part of the book to write about? Was it that or some other aspect? My favorite part was probably the early pieces in the book about young Jefferson Davis because I think today Jefferson Davis is truly one of the lost men of American history. We don't know anything about him. Nobody reads about him. Certainly no one reads his memoirs anymore. If anything, Davis has come down as a stereotype. Uh, he's thought of as an arrogant, inflexible, impatient, leader of a slave empire that lost and he vanished from history. Jefferson Davis is actually fascinating and prior to the Civil War most Americans thought he would be a future president of the United States, not Abraham Lincoln. In fact, many people prior to 1857 would have said, Abraham who? Davis had been a congressman, a senator, a secretary of war, a war hero. Lincoln had been a one-term congressman, an obscure man from Illinois. So one of the most pleasurable things was rediscovering Jefferson Davis and finding out what his role was in America before the Civil War began. And you, one of the things that, that, that leads to then is that Jefferson Davis is not the, the villain of the piece, as you might sort of expect, because you've got Lincoln on one side and you're, you're contrasting both um, sort of the, um, the death of Lincoln is interspersed with um, scenes from Jefferson Davis's life and then the train as it goes on is also interspersed. So you have yes. these things that are, you know, obviously calling out for the c comparisons. And if you've got somebody as, you know, iconic as Lincoln, you're, you're sort of putting somebody on the other side, but it doesn't come off as a villain in this case. And uh, I, I'm curious about how that's been received. Is that something that a lot of people have remarked upon um, and said, I find this really interesting that you're putting them in juxtaposition because they're often in juxtaposition because it's, you know, Davis versus Lincoln, but not, I think, in the sort of life, the, the, the short frame of time and the one after the other and the way that it goes through in this book. Well, people have been surprised to find how much Abraham Lincoln and Jefferson Davis had in common. We think of them as polar opposites, union, confederacy, uh, freedom, slavery. But they had many similar things, especially in early life. Both born in Kentucky, less than 100 miles apart, less than a year apart, and both men born in log cabins. Mm -hmm. In early life, both lost their first loves. Lincoln in New Salem, he lost Anne Rutledge, who we now know is certainly the first woman that Lincoln had a strong attachment to. Jefferson Davis met 18-year-old Sarah Knox Taylor, the daughter of General Zachary Taylor when he was an army officer in the Western Frontier. They married, and both of them got malaria, and after 12 weeks of marriage, she died. Lincoln and Davis were crushed and changed by these experiences. They were similar physical type. They were both known for their great speaking ability, their great charisma. They were both analytical, intellectual men. Mm -hmm. During their presidencies, each man lost a favorite son in his White House, and they were, they were devastated by those tragedies. Both loved the old Union. Before the Civil War, Davis loved the United States, he loved the Union, and he was not eager to secede, and he didn't want to be and didn't campaign to be president of the Confederacy. So they had so many interesting similarities. Okay. Uh, your law professors, let's move on to mm -hmm. your background and say that you've got a degree in law from UCLA. Um, they taught you to write in a specific way, which is not the way I think you're writing this book. Mm -hmm. um, I, I doubt that a legal brief would be prepared <laughs> in, in this way. Uh, how have you changed as a writer as you've written through historical nonfiction like mm -hmm. this, as you've done in a number of different times. I mean, you've got a book, uh, I think you co-wrote a, a book about the Encyclopedia of Lincoln's death, if I remember. Well, yeah, it, it's, it's called Lincoln's Assassins, Their Trial and Execution, and that's really a history of the photographs, mm -hmm. uh, newspaper stories, relics, you know, autographs, all kinds of things related to the trial and execution of Booth's co-conspirators who were involved in his plot to murder Abraham Lincoln. I think the big difference from law school and now is that legal writing tends to focus on the facts and argument and analysis. And that suggests that not everything has to be told in a chronological order. You're making points by theme. You're arguing by theme or by topic or by an accretion of evidence, often trying to prove a point. 
Well, it's almost the opposite of the historical writing I do because I want to really bring the story alive. And when I write, I try to write it as a novel, even though it's all true. And by that I mean I try to keep the timeline in real chronological order, just the way events unfolded in history, just the way Lincoln would have experienced something or Davis would have experienced. On day one, you don't know what happens on, on day 10, mm -hmm. and you don't go back between day one, day 10, day five, day 30, and you don't jump around. And so I try to tell the story that way, always keeping it in its original time format and also with vivid, colorful descriptions of the people, of the places, of the events. I really want my readers to feel like they were there when these things were happening. Okay. Well, though, um, you, you've, you've got at least one thing from um, the fiction canon that I noted that you're, you, you're putting in um, foreshadowing. Yes. Uh, that there's a number of times. There's yes. one time, uh, one of the people that was in charge of the incarceration of uh, Jefferson Davis, there's a foreshadow that um, his treatment of Jefferson Davis was going to cause problems for him later. Yes. Um, and I remember reading that thinking, oh, okay, so we're going to um, be looking forward and, and, and uh, into the story as well. So <clears throat> um, the, uh, you've also got manhunt and bloody crimes adaptations coming uh, somewhere, and I don't know if you're writing them specifically, but they're going to be intended for young readers, right? Yes. Young readers. Yes. So how does that function? I mean, if you've got a title like Bloody Crimes, <laughs> it suggests that maybe something needs to change before it gets made into Well, a you'd adult. be surprised at what a ruthless taste children have <laughs> for blood. Okay, well, but their parents <laughs> are buying it for them. So well, for, in the case of Manhunt, uh, the Manhunt children's book has come out from Scholastic, the Harry mm -hmm. Potter publisher and it's called Chasing Lincoln's Killer. And they did not ask me to take out any of the blood or the gore, and, and I'm glad they didn't, because my view is children should see what real history is. We really shouldn't have to sanitize it or hide it from them, because somehow they know we're deceiving them, or they know we're lying, or they know we're trying to protect them too much. So I, I kept that in. In the case of the adaptation of Bloody Crimes, which will be ready soon, uh, my two boys gave me advice on this. Uh, they told me what readers What want. ages were they? they well, were they're now 12 and 13. Okay. So they were... That's a bloodthirsty <laughs> age, too. <laughs> and so uh, what they said to me about a year ago when I got going on this kid's book, uh, we know what readers want. And I mm -hmm. said, what do they want? Uh, one boy said, readers want blood. And the other one said, and knives. <laughs> <laughs> we and then I offer both. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, you were able to supply yes. what they were, the, the public was demanding yes. um, in that one. And, uh, well, it's, it's interesting because it seems like a pretty bloody episode. I mean, there were a lot of people hanged. There were, uh, you know, a lot, there were people sh the shootings. There's all this kind of stuff that feeds the, into it. The Secretary of State savagely stabbed in his right. house. Essentially, his whole family almost stabbed to death. Mm -hmm. It was really a scene out of the Charles Manson killings, the Helter Skelter killings, bloody handprints on the doors, blood all over the carpets. People have forgotten, people have forgotten how terrible the night of the assassination mm -hmm. was because it just wasn't Lincoln. The vice president was supposed to be murdered, Andrew Johnson, the only reason he survived was his assassin got drunk, got afraid and ran away. But one man attacked everyone in the home of Secretary of State Seward with a knife, and he almost killed them all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I remember reading about that. It was an amazing uh, story that is encapsulated that. And with that amazing story, Manhunt is currently being made into, uh, is going to be made into a nine-part HBO yeah, series. Yeah, a nine-part HBO miniseries, which is being produced by David Simon, who did The Wire and Homicide Life in the Street. Okay. And it's about half written so far. HBO has asked for the re rest of the episodes to be okay. written. So I imagine that'll be on uh, TV, I hope, within a year or two. Okay. But that's not something that you're working on. You well, I am involved in working, working on that. that. How does that work for you? You take a book that you've worked this hard on as a solitary author, and other people are brought in to dramatize. Well, the most important thing is that an author shouldn't be a prima donna about it and think, oh, they've ruined my work, they've changed it. Well, of course they have to change it. How could a 400-page book? be literally translated to screen. Mm -hmm. It has to be reduced, intensified, adapted. So I agree with doing that. So I'm not standing aside thinking, you're ruining my book. I think I'm lucky that someone is making a TV series for my book. Okay. 
All right, and uh, unlike a lot of authors, I'm curious about one other thing. You don't use social networking sites. Um, I'm gonna <laughs> jump you from the Victorian age to now. Yes. And say, I, I was surprised when I went back to, to do some of this research that your Facebook page is shut. It's not a fan site. Um, apparently, you actually interact with people as a, as a, as a person on that, and uh, you don't have a Twitter account. No. Your website goes to your publisher. How have you avoided doing these things as a writer <laughs> in this age? You know, if you've got the success that you've got with a bestseller uh, or, or that kind of thing, how does, how does that work? Well, partly, I don't think I'd ever be comfortable having a, 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 a Facebook page or, or sending out tweets that were constantly telling people how great I am or look what I've done now, I'm going here, I'm going there. I do think at a certain point a book should speak for itself okay. and the readers should decide what they think about it. You know, I don't write for others. I hope I'm read, but I don't write to please others because I don't know what people like. I don't know what people want. I only know what I like. And I hope that people and readers will like what I'm interested in and what I'm writing about. So I really don't want to be out there every day telling them, uh, here's what I've done. You should read me. I'm, I'm doing this. I'm thinking this. It almost seems too self-focused okay. or too self-centered to be bringing constant attention to oneself okay. that way. Although, you know, the interesting thing with that is if you look at people who are, are tweeting and uh, who are authors, they often talk about you know, what they're working on and it sounds like that's something that you just want to stay away from to not tell people until the book is done, well, to I, not I, tell the process. I do feel that too much talk can ruin it. Okay. You can talk a book to death before you finish writing it. Right. So at least I feel like I don't like to talk too much in detail about what I'm working on because I want to have those thoughts as I'm writing the book. Okay. I don't want to talk it out before I put it on the page. Well, at the risk of talking out the <laughs> next book, tell me what your next book is. What are you working on? Well, I'm working on a couple of things. I'm working on a book about the Civil War period. Maybe it'll be more about the common people and not heroes like Lincoln and Davis. Okay. But I'm also going to take a little break because I spent the last several years in manhunt and now in bloody crime surrounded by death and sadness and mourning and tragedy. And I, I think I need a break. And a couple friends... So some comedies coming yeah, out? Well, a couple <laughs> friends of mine are very successful thriller writers, novelists, and they've encouraged me to give it a try. So I'm going to try to write a thriller novel, which I hope I could turn into a series. Uh, I'd like to sort of turn the page for a while and not be with all these historical tragedies and do something that's fresh for me. We'll see how it works. Uh, one of the tough things about doing these history books is the massive amount of research required which I'm looking forward to not doing for a, for a thriller novel. But the good thing about history, in my case, Abraham Lincoln, Jefferson Davis, and all the other players have written the plot for me. Now in fiction, I'm going to have to come up with all of it myself. Okay. So that'll be a very different uh, take on it. Do you define yourself now as a writer? What's your self-definition? Do you say, I'm James Swanson writer, <laughs> or I'm James Swanson uh, nonfiction writer? What, what do you say when you meet people? Uh, Shorthand, I'll say I'm, I'm a writer, I'm an author. Uh, I really don't think of anything beyond that because uh, I'm interested in film, I'm getting interested in fiction now. Uh, I won't call myself a historian or an expert, I just I call myself a writer. I, l I like a great, exciting historical tale and I, that's what I try to tell. All right, and uh, last question, who, if you, aside from your own books, uh, which we encourage everyone to read, what do you think, who else do you think best defines that kind of um, writing that you're talking about history to bring it alive, to make it uh, interesting for people? Um, what's your go-to people? Who are your Well, I, I would certainly say Doris Kearns Goodwin, uh, David McCullough. They're really models to me of, of how to tell great nonfiction tales. Okay. Well, James L. Swanson, I want to thank you very much My pleasure. for being here today to talk about Bloody Crimes, The Chase for Jefferson Davis, and The Death Pageant for Lincoln's Corpse. Thank you. And from the Center for the Study and Teaching of Writing at The Ohio State University, this is Writer's Talk with Doug Dangler saying, keep writing.